Welcome everyone. And thanks for joining us today for prioritizing California native plants for butterfly and moth conservation. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment to welcome any of you who are new to the California Native Plant Society and tell you a little bit about our organization. California's native plants are special from the Joshua tree to the redwoods, to the poppy fields, to little tiny plants that most people never even notice. We live in the, one of the most botanically rich places on earth with more types of native plants than any other state in the US. CMPS is a nonprofit organization made of more than 10,000 members, 35 local chapters, and a team of staff. Together we work to conserve wildlands, protect endangered species, collect scientific data, and restore nature to our home and public landscapes one garden at a time. We also do take people out into the field as soon as, uh, as, soon as field trips start up again. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, none of us, not the insects, the birds, nor humans can exist without plants. So when we save plants, we save everything. If you're inspired by what you see and hear today, um, become involved. You can become a member by visiting cnps.org forward slash join or you can sign up to receive our emails um, at, at the main CNPS at cnps.org forward slash get dash connected. Or um, you can get emails from the chapter by signing up on the chapter website. I wanna introduce um, Katie Barrows who is our tech host today and she'll explain to you how to ask questions. Thanks Orchid. Um, so we're going to hold questions until the end. If Chris chooses to answer a question during the middle of the presentation, he can do so, but generally it works better if we can just hold questions. And if you could please put your questions in the Q&A as opposed to the chat, I'll be monitoring both, but it's... You're on mute, Katie. Oh God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies, I'll start over. Um, okay, so we're going to um, have questions at the end of Chris's presentation. Um, we'd like it to ask you, if you would, please, to use the Q&A for your questions. You can type those in, and then at the end of his presentation, I'll go through the questions, and Chris can answer them, and if there's any other things you want to add, of course, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So please just use the q and I'll monitor that. I'll also monitor the chat if any questions pop up there. Thanks. Okay, so now on to our speaker. Chris Cosma is a PhD candidate. Uh, as you can see on the slide in evolution, ecology, and organismal biology, but he um, says that he focuses on the effects of climate change on moth pollination. So this is fascinating stuff and, um, and uses citizen science uh, modeling and, um, and, and geographical information systems to do his work. So he's going to tell us more about it. He knows more about himself than me. So um, welcome, Chris. Yeah, thank you so much, Orchid, for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me here to speak today. I'm really excited to talk to you all about what I've been doing to advance um, butterfly and moth conservation in California, and really what we all can be doing to help out in this really important task. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. If you can't hear me, if things aren't working, please uh, be sure to let me know. I'm not monitoring the chat or Q&A necessarily, but you can always unmute and, and let me know if, if things are not working out. All right, so as Orchid said, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Riverside. I'm in my fourth year here, um, probably going to be finishing up in about another year. Um, and I am in Dr. Nicole Rafferty's lab. So here's our wonderful lab group here. Our PI, Dr. Rafferty is here in the middle. There I am. Um, we have a couple graduate students as well as postdocs in the lab. And we actually just got a new graduate student who will be joining us um, next year. So if you're interested in learning more about our lab, our link is posted down here. Um, and I can also share that link later. So in our lab, we all, focus on some aspect of the effects of climate change on mutualisms. 
Um, and mutualisms are just ecological interactions in which both species benefit. So um, the most well-known mutualism that I know you all are probably familiar with is plant pollinator interactions. Um, so pollination is the way that insects uh, and other animals transfer pollen um, from one flower to another and thereby allow plants to reproduce. Um, and so that's probably our most um, important study system or at least our most popular in our lab. But we also study things like below ground mutualism such as the interactions between plants and mycorrhizal fungi that help plants take up nutrients as well as the fungi um, get the nutrients that they need. All right, so as Orchid said, I focused my research on moth pollination, particularly in Southern California. Um, and we have a lot of really important moth pollination interactions that occur all around us, especially in the desert ecosystems that are very common down here in Southern California. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but I did wanna mention that throughout this talk, I'm gonna try to paint a picture for you of moths, not as these annoying pests that eat our clothes and um, feed on the uh, grains in our pantry or fly into your face and your lights at night. Although they may do these and you probably are familiar with these more annoying aspects of moths, um, what I'm going to try to do today is paint a picture of these wonderful organisms as important pollinators, number one, as well as important food sources for um, birds, bats, and other organisms. Um, and so moths really are very important parts of our ecosystems, um, even though they've been somewhat vilified, um, at least in popular culture. Um, all right. So unfortunately, I have to begin this talk with some bad news. Um, and I wanna start with this to get it out of the way. The bad news is insects are not doing so well. Um, so you may have heard the headlines or read the headlines, um, such as this one from the New York Times in 2018, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Um, and I don't wanna downplay the severity of the situation. Um, in fact, insects really are not doing well. A recent report found that almost 40% of insect species could be extinct in the next couple of decades. Um, and so this is a figure from this paper that's just showing all of our groups of insects, our insect orders here. I mean, we can see our Lepidoptera, our butterflies and moths are over here, the um, second and uh, third to last bars here. And this is just, these bars are just showing the proportion of total species on the y-axis. So up at one, we have 100% of the species and the proportion of these species that are in some sort of decline, whether they're declining in the blue, vulnerable in the orange, endangered in the yellow, or in fact extinct um, in the gray bars. And so we can see that no insect order is safe. Almost all insects um, have some species that are in some state of decline and some are much worse than others. So we can see for whatever reason here, I'm not really sure why, but dung beetles really are not doing well. Almost 100% of their species are in some sort of decline. Um, and we can see over here what I focus on, butterflies and moths, the order Lepidoptera, are also not really doing so well. These bars are pretty high. Over 60% of butterfly and moth species are threatened. Um, and in particular, we can see that butterflies, um, a lot of these species are actually already extinct. So this is not good news. Um, and diving a little bit deeper into butterfly and moth decline, um, a study from the UK um, in 2021 found that 40% of moths are declining in abundance in Britain um, since 1968. So here's the main figure of this paper that's just showing this negative trend through time. Um, and here's one of their, uh, their study species, the Sussex emerald, a little um, green moth that they use as an indicator species. But I did want to offer a glimmer of hope for us here in the US. So a lot of these reports that are heralding um, the coming of the insect apocalypse, um, most of these come from Europe. So let's see, looks like my screen is lagging a little bit. Um, so a lot of these reports are coming from Britain, other parts of Europe. 
And that's um, because in the UK, um, they ha have a much longer history of intensively human managed landscapes. Um, so people have been there for much longer, um, farming, uh, bulldozing the land for all of our variety of human purposes um, for much longer than we have been in the US. And so it turns out that recent reports are beginning to show that actually in the US, our insect populations appear to be relatively more stable than they are in Europe. Um, and so that's really good. We have a little bit of a chance here. Um, but what this really means is that we are in a super critical stage of insect conservation in the US right now. Um, we have a chance to prevent the worst from happening, to prevent our insect populations from following the same course that they have in the UK and other parts of Europe. And this is made ever more critical by the fact that we know several taxa are unambiguously in decline, and this unfortunately includes butterflies and moths. Um, several papers have found that uh, butterflies are declining right here in California and in the Western US. So we have seen about almost a 2% annual decline in butterfly abundance in the Western US over the last four decades. Um, so every year there's 2% less butterflies flying around out there. And this includes, unfortunately, common species like this um, West Coast lady, that's pictured here, a super common butterfly. Um, we see it down here in Riverside and in Southern California, um, but it too is declining. And I'm gonna circle back to the idea of common species declining later in my talk. So another example right here in Southern California, there's been, um, well, 18% of butterfly species in Griff Griffith Park, which is in Los Angeles, one of the largest urban parks in the state, 18% um, of those butterfly species have gone locally extinct in the last century. So that's a pretty drastic reduction. Um, so the question is, why does Lepidoptera butterfly and moth decline matter? Why do we care about that? Why am I studying this in my dissertation? Well, I don't think I have to convince most of you why we care about insect decline, why it's a bad thing, but I'm gonna go into some specific examples about why Lepidoptera decline in particular is really, really bad news. Um, first of all, Lepidoptera, which include, again, butterflies and moths, are one of the most diverse insect orders. It's second only behind beetles. Um, so we have worldwide hundreds of thousands of Lepidoptera species. And right here in North America, we have over 13,000 species of Lepidoptera. And this number is likely much, much larger. There's, there's tons of undescribed species out there, including here in Southern California. Um, so we have a tremendous diversity of moths and butterflies. And something that most people are not aware of that I like to point out is that the overwhelming majority of these species of Lepidoptera are moths and not butterflies. Um, so although butterflies often get most of the attention, um, again, 95% of species are, of Lepidoptera are moths. Um, and so we can see this is a, what we call a phylogenetic tree that just shows the evolutionary relatedness between um, organisms. And so it's not really important to understand what's going on here, but what I did want to point out here is that this small highlighted section um, are our small subset of butterflies um, out of all of these Lepidoptera, the majority of which being moths. And there's actually a joke among people that study butterflies and moths that butterflies are really just day flying moths because when we look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, um, butterflies truly are just a small subset of um, Lepidopter that evolved to fly during the day. Um, so yeah, um, I'm gonna keep coming back to the fact that moths are underappreciated and really important organisms here because that is the basis of my research. All right, so another reason why Lepidoptera decline is really bad news is because they are functionally important herbivores as larvae and pollinators as adults. So I'm gonna go through the Lepidoptera life cycle here. We'll be using this throughout this talk. Um, and this will be showing pictures of the monarch butterfly life cycle because it's probably our best studied and best understood example of a uh, Lepidoptera life cycle, but this applies to all Lepidoptera. So we have our eggs that are deposited on our host plants. We have the larva 
stage, which we call the caterpillar more commonly. We have the pupa stage, which um, is also called the chrysalis or the cocoon. And then we have our adults. So as larvae, again, these species are herbivores. They eat plants. And as adults, they are pollinators or at least visit plants for nectar. Um, so adults have sucking mouth parts. They can only drink, they can't eat. Um, so our adults are visiting flowers um, for nectar and they also visit other things like tree sap, um, even blood and feces of animals. They can basically drink anything that is in liquid form and that has nutrients in it. All right, so I wanna circle back to this idea of important herbivores because some of you may be scratching your head. What does it mean to be an important herbivore? Um, and, and herbivory, um, it often gets a negative connotation. So I wanted to kind of emphasize this point. Um, again, caterpillars, butterflies and moths in their larval stage are herbivores, they eat plants. Um, and they also serve as prey for birds and other animals um, in that larval stage. And so in eating plants and then being eaten by birds and other animals, Lepidoptera actually transfer more energy from plants to other animals than all other herbivores combined. So we have tons of herbivores out there, all sorts of different types of insects, beetles, um, plant sucking insects. And we also have mammals that are herbivores as well as reptiles and all sorts of animals. But Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths are the single most important herbivores across ecosystems worldwide when it comes to taking energy from plants and then passing that energy up the food chain to other organisms. And so the point here is that herbivory is actually a really good thing when we look at it from an ecosystem perspective. It fuels our terrestrial food webs. And so what I mean by that, again, is that starting with our caterpillar herbivores, we see that they are eaten by other organisms. So that plant energy that they take up into their bodies is then um, assimilated into the bodies of these predators. And then those predators then are eaten by higher level predators. Um, so maybe birds are eaten by hawks and other predatory birds. And then another important thing to remember about Lepidoptera is that our caterpillars, of course, um, metamorphosize into our adults. So we have um, caterpillars turning into moths and butterflies. And those moths and butterflies in their adult stage also serve as really important food sources for bats and, uh, and tons of other organisms out there. So some um, interesting facts about uh, caterpillars in their larval stage is that they, um, they make up to 90% of the diet of some of our native songbirds. So here we have a um, bird feeding a caterpillar to its young. Um, and these Lepidoptera larvae, these caterpillars are especially important to young baby birds. So they can make up almost 100% of the diet of our young baby birds. And then again, uh, our adult moths uh, especially serve as food sources for bats. And some bats, in fact, are what we call moth specialists, and they almost exclusively eat moths. And so it's no surprise that Lepidoptera declines, which have been happening worldwide, including here in the Western US, have been linked to declines in our native songbirds and our native bat species. Um, so, um, a statistic from a paper by um, Doug Tallamy um, from 2021. And by the way, if you haven't looked into the work of Doug Tallamy, he does a lot of really interesting work about Lepidoptera, um, about their importance to terrestrial food webs and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I highly recommend looking into his research. Um, so they, they found that insectivorous birds, so birds that um, pretty much exclusively rely on insects for their diet, have declined by 2.9 billion individuals over the last 50 years. In contrast, non-insectivorous birds, so our seed-eating birds, some of them um, are our predatory birds that um, eat meat, but these birds that don't rely on insects have actually increased by 26.2 million individuals. So we see this drastic difference between how birds that eat insects are doing versus how, how those that don't rely on insects are doing. All right, so switching over into the adult stage. So we saw that the larvae are really important food sources and herbivores. 
our adult butterflies and moths are really important pollinators. And so we all probably know that butterflies fly around and visit flowers during the day. Um, and so butterflies get most of the credit here, but my research and a growing number of studies are showing that moths are actually really important pollinators, uh, both wild and agricultural plants. And so I'm gonna dive into this a little bit more. So some, when I say agricultural plants, I of course mean the plants that we eat in our diets. Um, and recent studies have shown that moths help pollinate things like avocados and apples and berries. And um, although I can't really find wide support for this, I have found right here in my backyard where I have an orange tree, Let's, hopefully you can all see this video um, of a moth visiting orange blossoms or nectar and thereby probably helping pollinate these orange trees as well. Um, and so in all likelihood, moths are out there at night pollinating, flying around just as much as butterflies and bees are during the day, but they're much less studied. And so my research is, is trying to fix that and, and give a little bit more credit where credit is due to these important nocturnal pollinators. Um, so we see that they're important for agriculture, but right here in Southern California, we also have many examples of how moths are really important pollinators of our wild, our natural native plants. And so we have the yucca yucca moth interaction, which some of you may be familiar, familiar with. It's a really important study system for evolution and co-evolutionary dynamics. Um, and it's a really highly specialized interaction between a couple specific moth species and these yucca plants that grow um, around here in Southern California. Um, we have the hawk moth pollination of datura species. So our sacred datura jimson weed that grows all around here, these big white blossoms that you probably see are visited and pollinated by these big hawk moths, which can be as big as your hand. And then we have hawk moths like this white line sphinx that um, pollinate evening primrose species, another important native species, as well as agave species. So this is actually what we call a crepuscular pollinator, which is just a fancy word meaning moths that visit um, plants during the dawn and dusk hours, so those twilight hours. So this is a, another white line sphinx visiting an agave probably either at dawn or dusk. So a lot of my research that I'm not gonna be talking about as much today um, involves going out to field sites across Southern California, trapping moths with these homemade bucket light traps that I've designed, which are literally just a bucket, a five gallon bucket you can get at Home Depot and a UV light placed on top. And the moths of course are attracted to lights and um, they get trapped in this, in this bucket so that I can study them. Um, here's an example showing all these moths in this bucket. Um, I then pin and identify these moth species. So here's one of my boxes showing some of our cool local moths. Here's some more of these, um, our, our white line sphinx and some of our other moth species here in Southern California. And, oh, and we find some really cool moth species here in Southern California. Um, sorry, my, my video's lagging a little bit, PowerPoint. Um, takes a toll on my CPU, I think. Um, if, if it's lagging too much for you guys, just let me know. Um, but yeah, we, we find some really cool moth species. Here's a uh, Manduca rustica, which is a, another hawk moth species, which I think is really beautiful. Um, we get the tiger moths. So this is one of our tiger moth species, which are really colorful and, and cool looking as well. Um, and there's thousands of species down here in Riverside. Again, Lepidoptera, especially moths, are one of the most diverse insect orders. A lot of these species that I'm catching are completely undescribed, probably new to science. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, get some, some publications describing new species eventually. Um, all right, so in the, in the other part of this research, the lab component, I bring these moths back to the lab and I I find the pollen that's hiding on their proboscis. So again, their proboscis are these sucking mouth parts that they use to um, drink nectar from flowers. And in doing so, they pick up pollen on those mouth parts and they transfer it from one plant to another and thereby pollinate these plants and help them reproduce. And so we can see these pollen grains on this moth proboscis. And there's a lot of pollen contained on these moth proboscides. So th this one especially is all clogged up with pollen. It has so much pollen, I don't even know how it was functioning. <laughs> um, 
And so, so far in this research, I've found that over 50% of moths in Southern California habitats are transporting pollen. And so these aren't just our hawk moths, these moths that have been well studied in terms of their pollination activity. These are our boring gray moths that you see flying around your light set at night. Um, you know, you probably never gave them a second thought, but these moths are likely pollinating our wild and maybe our agricultural plants as well. Um, and so the, when I continue this research, um, we'll see exactly which species of these moths um, are transporting which species of pollen and, and pollinating which plant species. All right. So we know that Lepidoptera are important to ecosystems in both their larval and adult stage. And so um, we know that we wanna protect them. We wanna protect these ecosystem services that natural populations of plants rely on, maybe that our agricultural plants rely on um, and thereby humans rely on for food. And so in, in to do this, to achieve these conservation goals, we need an understanding of why Lepidoptera are so impacted by global change. And so a lot of it comes down to the same reasons that any insect populations are declining. We saw in the beginning of this talk that no insect group is safe from, um, from human activities. So a couple of these um, are habitat destruction. So just bulldozing forests and other habitat to put our roads and our buildings and everything else that we build, um, we are taking away that natural habitat, including those plant species that Lepidoptera and other insects rely on. We have climate change, which is the main focus of my research, it has all sorts of effects. In Southern California here, we know mostly um, the effects of increased temperature and drought, which are becoming worse and worse through time. Um, we also have storms and wildfires and all sorts of other stuff that are affecting populations of wild plants and animals. We have pesticide use, that's really bad for insects. So um, these, when they spray these pesticides in our agricultural fields, they're not only killing the pests that eat our vegetables and other plants, but they're also killing our, our natural native insect pollinators and herbivores that we need in our ecosystems. And then we have invasive species. So this is one of the more common examples of kudzu, um, which is over on the East Coast in the South, not here in California per se, um, but, but we have all sorts of invasive plant species, uh, invasive animal and insect species that are out competing our native plants and animals. And then a unique threat to especially to moths, is light pollution. And this has recently gained a lot of attention in, in the literature. So <clears throat> light pollution uh, is increasing every year by an insane amount. I forget the stats, but um, it's pretty scary when you look at it. And when you look at these maps of light pollution, you can see just how much of our nighttime skies are affected by our artificial lights, um, you know, street lights. Uh, parking lot lights, even the lights from your home shining out into the night. Um, and we can see here that California is actually a hot spot of light pollution. Um, we have a lot of development here in California, a lot of artificial lights at night. And the effects of light pollution are numerous. So light pollution disrupts the mating and feeding behaviors of moths and increases their risk of predation. So moths are attracted to lights. We, anyone who's observed them at a porch light knows this. Um, and that act of being attracted to these lights um, puts them at risk of predation from bats and other organisms that actually have learned to come to these artificial lights where they can find large numbers of moths to eat. Um, they can get stuck at the lights, meaning that you know they're attracted and then daytime comes and they're still there. They don't like to move during the day. And then nighttime comes again and then they're attracted to that same light. So they spend their whole life at that light and don't go out and pollinate and they don't go out and mate. And so it's kind of what we call an ecological trap for these organisms. So light pollution is bad news. Um, and, and I'm not gonna be talking about that as much today, but I do encourage you all to turn off your lights at night. If you don't need those porch lights on, if you don't need um, it, those, those landscaping lights on, please turn them off. It will do a huge service to the environment. 
All right, so, so again, Lepidoptera are affected by all of these factors that affect other insects as well, but, but part of the reason that we saw that those bars, those Lepidoptera bars in that figure were higher than a lot of groups is because Lepidoptera have these extremely tight reliances on our native plants. So um, again, I'm going to go through this life cycle showing how Lepidoptera rely on native plant resources at each stage of their life cycle. So eggs are deposited on our native host plants. We know the monarch um, likes milkweed, so they only deposit their eggs on milkweed. The caterpillars are highly, highly specialized on their host plants, and I'm going to talk more about this later. Um, so we know the monarch can only eat milkweed. That's why it's so important to plant milkweed. Um, even things like chrysalis and cocoon placement requires plant resources. So we can see that the, this, this chrysalis is placed on a branch, probably of a native plant. Um, and then we know oops, that adults also drink flower nectar, so they also rely on these plant resources. And native plants have been shown to be more attractive than non-native introduced plants. All right, and so the key word here really is native. And I really like this definition of native from uh, Rick Dark and Doug Tallamy in the book, The Living Landscape. A, a plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. So the emphasis of this definition that I really like is this emphasis on co-evolution. And so when I say co-evolution, I just mean organisms that have evolved alongside one another. Um, here we see to develop complex and essential relationships with one another. And in the context of especially caterpillar herbivory, that usually means that these caterpillars have evolved to eat a specific plant that they've evolved alongside. And because of that co-evolutionary arms race, they can now only eat that specific plant. They've evolved defenses to circumvent the defenses that plants have because they don't want to be eaten, but in doing so and in investing those resources to circumvent those plant toxins um, of that particular species, they lost their ability to eat any other plant species. And so because of this sort of co-evolutionary arms race between plants and their herbivores, about 90% of plant eating insects, including all insects, beetles, um, uh, hemiptera, not only lepidoptera, are host plant specialists. So specialists, again, meaning um, insects that can only rely on one or a few native plant species. And oftentimes it's literally just one plant species that they can eat. Um, all right, so it's no surprise given this that native plants support up to 15 times more native Lepidoptera species than introduced and ornamental plants. Um, and so it's, it's not good that most of our landscapes, our landscaping in our urban and suburban areas look like this. We have lawns of introduced grass species that, in, that provide almost no value to native organisms. We have um, usually trees and shrubs and bushes that are not from here that are introduced because they look nice, but they are providing little to no value to our native, um, our native insects. Um, and in fact, most of the plants that we use for landscaping are non-native introduced species. A study, again, by Doug Tallamy found that about 92% of trees in Portland neighborhoods are introduced. So these are um, just the trees that they use alongside these streets. Um, and the same goes for here in Southern California. This is just the study that I found that had an actual number. 92% of those trees are not native to that area. Um, and, and frankly, that's unacceptable if we want to be supporting our native insects um, and providing them the resources that they need. All right, so we've been talking a, a lot about ecological specialization and why that puts Lepidoptera at risk. And the reason is because um, specialist species are at greater risk of extinction under environmental change. So all of those things I talked about, habitat destruction, climate change, um, because specialist species are more easily uncoupled from their resources, their interaction partners that provide them the resources that they need. And so I'm going to go through a quick example here. Let's say we have what we call an ecological generalist. A generalist is just a species that can rely on many different plant species, many different resources. 
Um, and let's say that climate change or habitat destruction caused the loss of one of those interaction partners. So they can no longer eat this plant species. That generalist species is probably going to be okay because they have all of these alternative partners to rely on. But now let's look at a ecological specialist, which many of our, herb, our caterpillars are, and our, many of our lepidopter species in their larval stage are specialists. Um, relying on, again, just one or a few plant species. If climate change, habitat destruction, whatever it may be, cause the same loss of that plant species, that specialist is likely to be negatively impacted because it can only rely on that species. So we can see here that specialists under global change are much more vulnerable. And so it's no surprise that lepidopter declines, including right here in California. So a couple of studies by Forrester um, uh, in California found that um, these lepidopter declines are in fact driven by the loss of host and nectar plants. Host plants being the plants that caterpillar use um, and nectar plants being those plants that adults visit for nectar. Um, and so they're driven by the loss of hosts and nectar plants, and those loss of hosts and nectar plants, again, are driven by things like habitat destruction and climate change. All right, so that hopefully is the end of most of the bad news of this talk, and now I want to transition into talking about what we can do about it, um, what I've been doing about it, and what we can all do about it. Um, all right, so I want to real quick do a poll. So I'm going to drop this poll in the chat real quick. Um, let's see, I, I hope everyone can access this poll. Um, and if you can't, please let me know. But it's a one question poll just asking you to rank the factors that you prioritize when selecting native plants. So I know a lot of people here are native plant advocates. You probably use them in your yards, your gardens. Um, so let me know uh, by filling out this poll, what are your top priorities when selecting those plants? And I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to fill this out and we'll see what people think and try to be honest. I wanna get unbiased feedback here. All right, people do not see the poll. Let's see. Hey, hey Chris, it, it, it dropped in as text. So yeah, what, what you have to do is, here, let me- You can drop it in as a link. Yeah, let me see if I can, what, what you have to do is just uh, copy and paste this link into a web browser. Sorry, I should have, I should have mentioned this. So just the link that I dropped, copy and paste that into a web browser, and it should bring you to this poll. Um, and if that doesn't work, we can just move on from this. Um, yeah, so it'll, it'll ask you to just put your name in. It doesn't really matter. You can skip that if you like, um, and then it'll just bring you to that one question. Are people seeing that now? All right, great. So yeah, take a minute, um, fill that out. Some people are saying they can't see it still. Um, yeah, so if, if you can't see it still, um, maybe you can skip this part. <laughs> um, and if you can't figure out how to use it, that's totally fine. I know some of these uh, technology things are, are um, difficult to figure out. Um, but for those of you that can figure it out and fill it out, I'll give you another 30 seconds or so, and I'll see what people put. All right, I like the answers that I'm seeing here. So I'm gonna share my screen so that we can all see these answers. So most of you, it seems, are ranking um, benefits to native wildlife as your number one priority when selecting native plants. And that is what I love to see. So I don't have to spend too much time convincing you why we need to plant native plants for our native wildlife. Um, I see water use efficiency as the second priority here, um, low maintenance requirements. 
And then reduced need for pesticide is an important one that kind of ties into our benefits to native wildlife as well. Aesthetics is pretty low on the list, um, which I think is interesting because a lot of landscaping historically has been done only because of aesthetics. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna continue on. Thanks everyone for filling that out. Um, I like to get some active feedback during these presentations. Let me go back to my presentation here. All right. I'm hearing some feedback. Orchid, I think if you, yeah, stay muted. It. All right. Um, all right, so circling back to this question, what can we do about it? Well, the answer really is planting native plants. And so it looks like based on your ranked priorities, most of you know this, that we need to plant native plants to su support our native insects and other wildlife. And we know this especially from um, the really famous and popular example of the monarch butterfly. Um, and so this really supporting our native insects calls for a native plant focused approach to conservation. Um, so we knew that the, the monarch was at risk, so we planted milkweed, and this is obviously an ongoing effort. Um, but we know that the monarch is not the only butterfly or moth species that is at risk. And as we add more and more threatened Lepidoptera species to this list, we see that the list of native plants that we need to support those insects grows larger and larger. And so what I'm advocating for here is moving from a perspective focused on just individual species and interaction. So the monarch butterfly and its host plants um, to more of a, communi a community level perspective. So considering entire communities of threatened Lepidoptera species because entire communities of Lepidoptera are threatened. And so in order to move from this perspective of individual organisms to more of a community level perspective, um, the way I approach that is by using ecological networks. And so ecological networks are just a way to describe an ecological community based on interaction. So they describe the interactions between entire communities of plants here on the bottom and entire communities of Lepidoptera here on the top. So here we have what's called an herbivory network. Um, each uh, silhouette here just represents a species and each line represents its herbivory interaction with a native plant. So we see the monarch eats um, the milkweed. We see some of these caterpillar species rely on multiple host plants. Some of them rely on fewer. Um, and so analyzing these sorts of ecological networks um, can tell us a lot about how important different species are for conservation, how vulnerable species are in the context of global change. Um, and this can help us prioritize species for conservation. And so I'm going to be talking about that for the rest of my talk here. And this can be, you know, specialist insects like our monarch butterfly that only relies on um, few species of host plants. Um, and in the context of which plants are most important, um, what I'm going to advocate for here is that um, our generalist plants that support many insects in the community should be targeted in conservation. Um, all right, so that was an herbivory network, which can tell us a lot about which plants we need to support our Lepidopter herbivores. But again, remember that Lepidopter require native plant resources at different life stages as well, including this adult life stage where they visit our native plants for nectar. And so studies have actually shown that diet breath, um, which is just the number of plant species that these um, these organisms rely on in their larval and adult stage are significant determinants of Lepidopter extinctions. Um, and so again, specialist species are, are more at risk, but they're also independent determinants of Lepidopter extinctions. And what this means is that um, looking at the larval stage, uh, that determines how vulnerable they are to extinction. But separately from that, looking at the adult stage can also tell us if they're vulnerable or not. And so we need, what this tells us is that we need conservation efforts that consider these resource dependencies at each Lepidopter life stage, our larval stage when they're herbivores and our adult stage when they're pollinators. 
And so as a quick example of this, let's say we have a moth here that is a generalist pollinator. It can rely on all sorts of plant species for nectar. Again, if one of those plant species is driven extinct or locally extinct for whatever reason, that generalist species in its adult stage is probably going to be okay in its adult stage. But let's say we have that same exact species as a caterpillar here. So here's our, our moth species, but just as in its caterpillar stage before it turns into this moth. And it's a specialist, which again is often the case. Um, that, that same plant extinction we can see is going to affect that caterpillar. Um, and therefore, looking at this whole life cycle, um, uh, shows us that this species is much more vulnerable than if we just looked at the adult stage. So again, specialization puts these, these organisms at risk. Um, and one way we can study these sorts of um, interlinked dependencies in their larval and adult stage is by using multi-layer ecological networks. And these just link different interaction networks. So in this case, herbivory networks with pollination networks. So we have our Lepidoptera caterpillars and our Lepidoptera adults here. And in the case of Lepidoptera, these, can, these networks can be linked both by our shared insect species. So our Lepidoptera that are herbivores of these native plants in their larval stage and pollinators of these native plants in their adult stage. And they can also be linked by our shared plant species. So our plants that are herbivorized by Lepidoptera um, and then also pollinated by Lepidoptera. And a really good example of that, um, and this is my bias of moth pollination speaking, but here in Southern California and across California, we have our Datura species, which are herbivorized by our Manduca sexta, our um, our Carolina sphinx moths in their larval stage. Um, so here we have our, our tobacco hornworm, as they called, eating this datura plant in its larval stage. And then that same datura plant um, is pollinated by these hawk moths when they are adults. All right, so in order to study these sorts of dependencies, I've been using a resource called California Plants as Resources for Lepidoptera by Jeffrey Caldwell, and this is available on the CNPS website. Um, so if you're interested in seeing this guide, um, uh, I forget exactly which what one of the CNPS chapters has posted it at least. Um, and this guide just details herbivory and pollination interaction data between native California plants and Lepidoptera across the entire state. And so I'm gonna go through a couple um, findings that we've had from analyzing this data set. So first of all, we found that indeed caterpillars are more specialized than adults. And so, caterpillars, so our Lepidoptera herbivores here, have an average of 3.6 interactions per species, whereas our adults, our pollinators, have an average of 14.7 interactions per species. So we can see that our Lepidoptera in their larval stage are much more specialized, relying on fewer native plants um, for resources. We also found that caterpillars are more sensitive to plant extinctions than adults. Um, so we simulated plant extinctions. These are a, a computer simulation that just um, takes out a plant from this data set and shows how that loss of plant will affect um, the other organisms. And we found that for the caterpillars, it only takes an average of 1.4 plant extinctions to drive one caterpillar from that network. Um, on the other hand, it takes an average of 6.25 plant extinctions to drive one adult from that network. So we can see that it takes much fewer plant losses to lead to extinctions of Lepidoptera, or simulated extinctions of Lepidoptera from these networks. Meaning again, that caterpillars are more sensitive than adults. And this is important because a lot of conservation efforts focus on just one life stage. So um, we have pollinator gardens that are providing um, resources for our Lepidoptera pollinators, our butterfly gardens. But effective Lepidoptera conservation must include protecting those native nectar and host plants. Um, and and it really comes down to this idea that without the caterpillar, you don't get the butterfly or the moth. Um, and vice versa, without our butter, without supporting our adult, our pollinators, we're not going to get future generations of, of Lepidoptera. All right, so 
what we found here again is that caterpillars are picky eaters, they're specialists. So that means we have to be picky in choosing which plants to provide them in our, in our landscaping and our restoration projects, whatever it may be. And so really what I'm advocating for here is the fact that we don't just need pollinator gardens, we also need herbivore gardens. And again, herbivory is often seen as this negative interaction. Um, but, but, but we've seen here that herbivory is super important for terrestrial ecosystems, transferring that energy from plants to other organisms. So we need to support these Lepidoptera as herbivores. All right, so the last kind of part of this talk, and I'm running out of time here, um, is the question, how do we determine which plant species are the most important? And really answering this question um, requires facing an unfortunate reality is that we can't save everything. So we saw from the first part of this talk that 40%, a huge proportion of insect species worldwide could be extinct in the next couple of decades and could be. Um, what does that mean? Well, they, they might go extinct. It kind of depends on what we do now. Um, and, and so it requires these conservation efforts. But again, we're not gonna be able to save all of these species, 40% of the hundreds of thousands and millions of insect species worldwide. Some of them just aren't gonna make it. And that is a hard pill to swallow. So really a better question here is, how do we prioritize plant species for insect conservation, in this case, Lepidoptera conservation, knowing that we can't save everything? And so there's been sort of a dichotomy here um, in the way that conservationists and scientists think about this. Um, should we prioritize protecting rare specialist species? Um, so our monarch butterfly that only relies on one plant species, or should we also focus on, um, or maybe even prioritize protecting our common generalist species? And so most conservation in the US has focused on protecting these rare specialist species. And so the, um, here in Southern California, um, I'm assuming most of you are, are around here, we have our federally listed endangered um, Kino checker spot butterfly. Um, it's a specialist that relies on just a few native plantain species. Um, and so we focus conservation efforts on that and that's great. Um, but we also saw from those studies I cited earlier that common generalist species are also at risk. Um, and they may be providing broader benefits to ecosystems. So our common species that are pollinating many more plants, um, providing much more food for, for birds and bats. Um, an example of that is the West Coast lady. Populations are severely declining um, uh, on the West Coast. Um, it's one of the most common butterfly species, but the numbers are decreasing. Um, and so should we focus our conservation efforts on these species as well? Um, and really the answer probably depends on the context. Um, and I don't have the right answers for this. So these are kind of just points to put out there to, to encourage um, discussion and thoughts. Um, you know, should the goals of conservation and restoration professionals differ from those of the average home or landowner, um, the general public? Um, and what is the maximum difference that the average person can make um, in their yard or their garden if they're um, encouraged to use native plants? And really the answer that I've come to, and this, you're welcome to disagree with this. I know um, many people do. Um, but the, the answer that I've come to in the context of using native plants to support Lepidoptera is that we should probably be focusing on these plant species that provide the most benefit to the most number of species. So these generalist plants that support many insects in our communities, and maybe not so much these specialist plants that are not providing um, many resources here. And so I've, I've taken this a step further in this web tool that I developed I'm about to introduce um, is identifying keystone species. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but the idea of keystone species are just these species that are disproportionately important to maintaining the integrity and stability of the ecosystem. And so the way I've done that from a network analysis perspective is analyzing what we call network modularity. And so let's say here is our whole network, our whole plant pollinator network. Our modules are just these shaded regions. And these are just groups of more closely interacting species in that network. Um, 
And so two important roles have been proposed are module hubs, which are those species that are highly connected within the module here in red. And then our module connectors, those species that connect different modules in the network here in blue. And importantly, the loss of these module hubs and connectors has been predicted to lead to cascading extinctions within and across um, modules in this network. So basically, these are the important species to protect. If they are lost, then more species in that network will go extinct because of that loss. Um, and so this is a, a confusing graph. I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on it, especially because I'm running out of time. But what we found here in comparing these module hubs and connectors across these networks, so I've plotted the, the importance as module hubs and connectors in the pollination network here on the x-axis versus their, the same species importance in the herbivory network. And these are plant species. And we found these shaded regions here represent 50% of species that are only important in one network and not the other. So here we have this the plant species that are only important um, based on our definition of keystone here um, in the pollination network. And these blue species only important um, in the herbivory network. And really the important part of this is what, what it tells us is that when considering just one interaction type, just herbivory or just pollination, we miss a substantial proportion, 50% of plant species that are important over the course of the entire Lepidopter life cycle. And we're led to the same conclusion that effective Lepidopter conservation must include protecting native nectar and host plants. All right, and the same idea, without the caterpillar, you don't get the butterfly or moth and vice versa. All right, so lastly, I'm gonna introduce my web tool. Um, I am at time pretty much here. And so if you'd like to stick around and see how to use this tool, this tool is freely available online um, and I'll drop the link here now, but I'll go through sort of a tutorial on how to use it. Um, First, an important consideration is California is a huge and diverse state, and we're all fundamentally aware of this um, living in California. And what that means is that which plant species are considered our keystone species varies by location, depending on what species and interactions are present there. Um, this can vary latitudinally. So in Southern California, we're not gonna get the same species that we do in Northern California can vary longitudinally. So um, we're not gonna get the same species inland that we do on the coast. And also elevationally, we're not gonna get the same um, species on mountains as we do in lowlands. And so what this means is that we need localized results for each location in California, which species are the most important to plant in my region to support Lepidopter in their larval and their adult stage. So what I've done is I've um, layered geo-referenced plant occurrences. So these are just GPS locations of each plant species across California um, with our Lepidopter occurrences as well, same thing, as well as this interaction data. And what this allows this web tool to do is create localized interaction networks. So our plant pollinator networks, our plant herbivore networks, and this allows us to find the best native plants in each region of California, wherever you live, wherever you may be, um, to support Lepidopter species um, in their larval and adult stage. All right, so this is hosted on our Shiny. So, um, and I did want to say that this is definitely a work in progress, and I hope it doesn't crash because it does have a mem memory limit. I'm dropping the link in the chat. Go ahead and check it out. Um, and this tool can be used by res professional restorationists, um, you know, for ecological restoration sites, local lepidopter conservation efforts. But really, the purpose of this tool, the main purpose for me, is getting it out there for the general public to use. So we have. 50,000 square miles of monoculture lawns in the US, people's lawns that could be converted into native plant habitat, 2% um, of land in the United States. And so, so I want this tool to be used by people in their yards, gardens, um, urban parks and gardens as well, providing those resources for, for butterflies and moths in their, uh, in their larval and adult stages. Um, all right, so I'm gonna ask, I guess, Orchid, um, do you think I should go into this tutorial for now, um, or should I focus on answering some of the questions in the chat? <laughs> um, I, I think you should go through the tutorial, and, um, and, and people who are very interested in their questions will stay. 
All right, sounds good. So I'm gonna stop my share. I'm just gonna right. share my. All right, and again, this is a work in progress. So I, I welcome feedback and suggestions. Um, I'll I'll post my email as well so that everyone can contact me. Um, I'm not a web developer, so the tool has some some issues with the interface and it's a bit laggy, but I'm actually working with Calscape and CMPS to hopefully get this improved and, and hopefully put on one of those websites so it, it can be accessed by people across California. So I'm sharing my screen here, hopefully you can see it. Um, this is the app. Um, and so we have, oops. I'm not sure what's going on. Sorry, let me. Let me reshare because my computer is acting up. All right, so we have our supporting information here. You can read up on um, butterflies and moths, some background information. Um, and then the, the main controls in this tool. So again, this is a native plant finder. It's gonna help you find those native plants that are most important to plant in your area um, to support larval lepidopters, so our herbivores, as well as adult lepidopter, our pollinators. And so we have some decisions here to make based on what you're most interested in. First of all, you can choose whether to, you want to focus on butterflies, moths, or both. I recommend focusing on both. Again, the majority of Lepidopter, 95% of them are moths, and they get a lot less attention. You may not be awake to see them out um, visiting your plants necessarily, but they're really, really important for ecosystems. Choosing both will just show you plants that support um, butterflies and moths. And then we have the option, do we want to focus on our pollinators, so our Lepidopter in their adult stage, or do we want to focus on providing those host plants for our caterpillars, um, our Lepidopter in their larval stage, or we can find plants that may support both. One note, however, is that if you choose this option, both, it, the list is going to be restricted to those plants that are in our data set as providing nectar and uh, resources as host plants, and so the list is going to be a bit smaller. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on butterflies and moths. First, I'm just gonna look at our herbivores. So I like, I love to plant plants that provide uh, Lepidoptera herbivores, the resources they need. And so what I can do in this tool is I can either type in my address. So I'm here um, near the university. So I'm just gonna find plants right where I am. Um, it's gonna take a second for the tool to uh, search those databases for our interactions and for our species that are around me. Um, and then it's going to give me my list of priority plant species. So here I, I first I get this, um, this information. There are 73 native plant species that this tool has found that support 34 butterfly and moth herbivores within a three mile radius of my location. Um, and now we can click on these plant species. So these are scientific names. One of my main goals next is to put common names in here because I know, I know these scientific names are, are daunting, um, but I can click on this. I can be directed to Wikipedia articles. That's gonna show me a picture of this plant, um, information about it. Um, and then I can see a list of these caterpillars, these Lepidopter species that are supported by this plant species in my area. So I can see, okay, we have this um, moth that's, uh, that's supported. Another issue with this data set right now that I'm working on fixing is that we have some common pest species and, and unfortunately some non-native moth species that are included in this data set that I'm gonna purge out of there. Um, so make sure you shoot you do your research um, for now on which, which of these species we actually want to be protecting. But we can see that we have our, our moths that are um, supported here um, in their larval stage. If there are any threatened Lepidoptera species in your area, so federally listed, threatened, or endangered, there are 18 federally listed, threatened, and endangered. Most of them are uh, butterflies in California. A lot of these are in the Bay Area. Um, and then a couple of our other tabs here, we have our pollination network. So this is just a printout of those networks that I've been showing. You can use your computer to zoom up on that to see our plants in green here that are connected by our lines, our interactions to pollinators in this case, um, and which species those are. And so if you're interested in looking at the structure of these networks, you can see that here. 
Um, if you happen to live in a part of California, let's say I'm gonna, you can also press on this map to, to find the locations. Let's say I live out here in the forest um, and I my radius here is set to three miles. So it's gonna, okay, so now I see I only found one native plant species in this area. And so it's, it's only gonna have that one species listed. The issue here is that there's just not enough data in this particular remote location. So how to fix that is just to increase this radius. So let's say I'm gonna ch change it from three to 20 miles. So now it's gonna be searching in a 20 mile radius in this area. And here I can see now I have all of these plant species that are supported and the same thing. I can see the information on which caterpillars um, are supported by which plant species, et cetera. Um, all right, so, so yeah, like I said, work in progress, working with CMPS and Calscape to improve the interface, um, reduce the lagging and stuff. But as it is now, this tool should help you um, if you're interested in doing so to input your address wherever you live and find this list of these top plant species that you should be planting. Um, to support these lepidoptera. And I can change it over to adults now to see, okay, butterfly and moth pollinators here. Um, Achillea millifolium around uh, California is one of the most popular plant species for lepidopters in their adult stage. Um, I'm gonna move it back here to the university just so I can show you, you all more botanically minded folk, which of our species, um, and yeah, there's a question, can I leave in the non-native caterpillars but identify them as non-native? That's a great idea um, because some people may be interested in, like we have, you know, these native plant species that are also, you know, being used by these non-native Lepidopter species. So here in, I'm gonna reduce my radius a little bit because I have, sometimes you have too many results. And if there's too many results, this network figure may not be um, able to render. Um, so let's see, right here in Riverside for our butterfly and moth adults, our pollinators, we see that Aesculus californica is one of the top species that they're gonna be using. We can see that this is a list of, it looks to be over 20 species, mostly butterflies here using this plant species for nectar resources. Um, and again, these are often gonna be these generalist species, these generalist plant species that are um, supporting many insects in the community. Um, so the, the last thing I'm gonna um, go through right now is we have our threatened and endangered section here. So I'm working on improving this data so that these threatened species are actually detected where they occur, because I know that we have the Kino checker spot around Riverside there. But let's say I'm in El Segundo on the coast. I'm gonna type in my address here. I'm gonna click find plants. The app's gonna do its thing. It's gonna give me my priority plant species list, but then it's also gonna show me that I have a endangered Lepidoptera species here. So in this case, this is the El Segundo blue, um, a really cool looking small blue butterfly that's only known from a very specific location, um, dune ecosystems near El Segundo. Um, and so I can see that if I live in that area and I think I can provide those resources for this endangered lepidopter, then I can find those plants that I should be planting. So in this case, they only feed on this one species of Areogonum in this region. Um, and so again, coming back to that dichotomy, should we be supporting these common species that are providing more services for the community? Should we be focusing on these rare threatened species? Well, I'm trying to give an option here to do both. Um, so if there are endangered species in your area, you can find those plants that you should be planting to support them. All right, so for those of you that have stuck around, I'd like to get into answering some questions if that's okay. Um, maybe there are questions about how to use this tool to the best of its ability um, or other questions from the chat. So. so Chris, I can go through the questions. That'll make it a little easier for you. You can, um, I'll, I'll read the questions out and you can just respond. And if anybody wants to add a question, please feel free to do so. Sounds good. Does that work for you? Okay, so the first question is from Drew Feldman. What are moths, or excuse me, why are moths attracted to lights? 
All right, that is an excellent question. So um, that is not the particular focus of my research, but a lot of researchers who are studying moths in the context of moth decline are really worried about artificial lights um, because they, they pose a variety of threats to moths. So moths are nocturnal creatures um, for the most part. There are day flying moths. Um, but for the most part, they're active at night. Um, and, and so the question of why exactly they're attracted to lights is actually a really interesting one because it's unresolved. Um, there are a couple theories. The one that I agree most with um, is the idea that moths um, in their natural habitats, so before humans were here, um, use the light from the stars and the moon to navigate at night. So um, they, they need to be flying in straight lines um, and, and generally be able to know where they are in their nighttime landscapes where they can't necessarily see very well. And so by keeping the light of the moon or maybe the light of a particularly bright star on one side of their body, um, that was a way for them to fly in a straight line and generally just a way for them to, to be able to tell way that, where they are, where they're going at night. Um, and so the reason that worked was with the moon is because the moon is very far away. It doesn't matter where you are on earth, it's always gonna be on the same side of your body and there, therefore it allows you to fly in a straight line. But when our artificial lights, our street lights, our porch lights, whatever they may be, are very close to these moths, they're gonna to try to do the same thing and keep that light on one side of their body. But because it's so close, they're not gonna be able to do that. And so that's why we see moths spiraling towards light sometimes at night. They're trying to keep that light on one side of their body. They're confused because they think it's the moon. Um, and so they get uh, in that act of trying to use it to navigate, they actually inadvertently get attracted to it. Um, and so they spiral towards those lights. Um, so that's one of the theories. Another interesting theory is that these artificial lights, the wavelengths of the light actually imitate the wavelength of, um, of certain pheromones, certain sex pheromones that moths are attracted to. Um, I'm not sure if I've seen much support for that theory, but I think that's an interesting one as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, great, that's really helpful. Um, Cheryl Tolentino says, do you have a list of native plants to share that we can plant here in Riverside that support Lepidoptera species? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'd recommend you using the tool. So. Um, Again, I'll, I'll share my screen just real quick again to go through it. So let's say, again, I live here near, um, near the university. I'm gonna type in my university address. So I'm a, let's say I wanna support old lepidopter. I wanna support butterflies and moths in their larval and adult stage. So I just wanna find these top plants that are providing the maximum benefit across the board to as many lepidopter as possible in both the uh, life stages. And so I'm going to hit five plants or find plants with those criteria put in. And now on my priority plant species list, it's going to give me that list of those top species to use. So these are these plant species that we should be planting. And again, these are very common species, Helianthus anus, the common sunflower. It's called the common sunflower for a reason. It's everywhere. It's a native species. Um, everywhere in our landscapes, but it's a really important one. We can see this huge list of Lepidoptera species in their adult stage. So we have our pollinator list here, and then we have also this, these lists of caterpillars that they're supporting um, in their larval stage here. And so here's our list of top 10. If you're interested in finding more, we can use this uh, number of species to display tool here. And that's gonna just show me um, all of those species. Eventually we'll max out this list probably. Oops, um, let's see, maybe if I put it to 25. Well, we have a lot of results here. So this should give you plenty. If, if you're at a location where it's not showing you that many species, so there's blinks or there's an error that shows up, what I recommend doing is just increasing this radius. So I started at 10, but maybe I can put it up to, uh, or I started at five. If I put it out to 10, that's just gonna show me even more plant species in this area. Um, all right, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, a question from Anonymous. Why, po why poll on matters of private gardens and not, more importantly, on questions of habitat destruction promoted by developers and their political allies on planning boards? 
Uh, I may have missed the first part. Did was it why poll? The, the question was, I think, it was about your poll and why it was on matters of private gardens and not. I, I think the question is, what about the importance of habitat destruction promoted by developers and political allies on planning boards? <laughs> All right. Well, I see why you remained anonymous because that's. Uh, <laughs> so so yeah. The reason I put that poll in this particular talk is just because. Um, I know a lot of the audience here are not professional or restorationists. Um, and really the, the purpose behind this tool is twofold. Number one, I'd like it to be used by professional restorationists and conservationists as well. Um, and so they're welcome to do that and use it. But, but really, like I said, we, we have tons, tons and tons of land um, in people's yards and gardens across California, across the US that could be helping out in conservation. And it's a really important part of conservation because it's kind of all we have left. Um, you know, we, we have our big protected areas, we have our professionals working in those protected areas and that's great. But um, in this era that we're living in of rapid environmental change, rapid habitat destruction, we have a chance here to take one of those unused resources, those yards and those gardens and convert that into the critical native habitat for our native pollinators and other native wildlife. And so um, this tool is, is equally as directed at the general public to use in those sorts of things as it is at conservation. Um, and so the purpose of the poll is just to kind of get an idea of like, um, how, how people are thinking about using native plants in their landscapes, whether, whether they prioritize supporting uh, native, native insects. Um, and it, it seems for the most part that at least this audience, people are thinking about that, um, which is very, very reassuring. Um, all right. Great. Um, next question. I think you answered this one already, Chris, but I'll point it out. Are there keystone lepidopteran species identified in various ecosystems? Uh, yeah, so the idea of Keystone, as I've, I've presented it here, is kind of, again, using these network tools to just um, identify these species that are, for the most part, the ones that are generalists, providing the most resources to the most um, Lepidoptera species. Um, and so it's a little bit more complicated than that. The network tools are, are kind of extracting these scores that each species is given based on how well it's acting as a network hub and how well it's acting as a network connector and combining those to rank them basically. Um, and so that will vary. Like I said, California is a huge state. It will vary from location to location, which is why part of the reason I created this tool. There, there are similar native plant finding tools um, Doug Tallamy actually has one called Native Plant Finder, um, and and through our con through my conversations with him, he identified the issue of 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 the scale. So we need localized results in California. We can't really even do it from a county wide perspective because our county is in even Riverside County encompasses so many different habitat types. So I'm not going to want to plant the same plants, the same keystone species in one habitat type than I am in another. Um, uh, so that's why we try to provide these as localized results as possible. Um, and so those keystone species that show up on that priority plant species list should be the ones that are most important in a specific area, whether it's a specific habitat or a town or whatever it may be. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, Karen Hansen asks, in the in or commented in the Inland Empire, we have printed a butterfly garden guide, which we hand out to the public to get them to plant their own gardens. It has been widely successful. That's yeah. just a comment. Yeah, that's, I, I love those sorts of things. So I think um, those sorts of visuals are super um, impactful to the general public, especially showing them pictures of these organisms that they can attract, um, pictures of the beautiful plants that they can, um, Plants. And, and yeah, so, so part of this, part of these efforts are go hand in hand with outreach. So I present this at, you know, the, the insect fair in Riverside and I show people printouts as well as like, which plants should you be planting? Um, which butterflies should be, you be looking out for in, in your native habitats around you? So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Okay. Um, actually, this is another comment and question from Karen. I visited the local water district's demonstration garden yesterday, and they told me 
Home developers are required to put in drought tolerant landscapes instead of grass. Hallelujah. I visited several on the way home and sure enough, he was right. Drought tolerant plants nestled into a mulch covered front yard. I did further checking and they are mainly ornamental plants, not a host plant in sight. I believe this is now a state requirement for developers. Why don't we get them to tweak what they have to plant maybe 70% native pollinator plants, 20% host plants and 10% whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that brings up a really good point. Um, so drought tolerance is just like we saw in the whole list. Drought tolerance is just one of the reasons why we select plants. Um, and so these mandates that are going into effect to reduce water use in our landscaping are great and that they are reducing water use, which is good for the environment. But again, if we look at it holistically and say, well, what really do we want from these plants in our landscape? One of those things has to be supporting our native insects. Um, if, if all we do is plant, introduce ornamental species, it doesn't matter how drought tolerant it's gonna be in the long run for insects because we're not providing them the resources that they need. So I agree, it's really important for people to be aware that drought tolerance does not necessarily equal a native species. We have a lot of introduced species that are drought tolerant, but are providing no resources for our native insects. Um, so I think a lot more effort and understanding needs to go into how we choose our plants in our landscapes. And, and this tool is, is trying to get people to think more about that. Um, yeah, and particularly for herbivores, because you know there's pollinator gardens everywhere, but people don't really think about the herbivore stage that's just as important. Without the caterpillar, you don't get the butterfly. Um, so, so yeah, um, thank you for sharing that. Okay, um, and actually Karen has a follow-up saying she'd like to talk to you about the tools to be used and um, gives her email. And I don't know, Chris, maybe at the end, if you're willing, you could share your uh, contact information. Um, so I'll I'll, that my the next, and I'll forward you um, separately. I'll just forward you Karen's email address so you have it. Um, let's see. Cecilia asks, have you looked at differences in pollination by male and female Lepidoptera? I have noticed Kino females are far more specific to nectar sources than males. With the McNeil sooty wings, I have found females visiting flowers with more nectar than do males. Um, sorry, I, I think I, my internet connection broke up in the middle of that, so I... Oh, okay, let me try again. So the question is, have you looked at differences in pollination by male and female Lepidoptera? Mm -hmm. And she notes that Kino females are far more specific to nectar sources than males. And she's seen McNeil city wings. Um, she's found them with females visiting the flowers with more nectar than do males. Yeah, um, that is really interesting. I I have absolutely no experience with uh, uh, in, intraspecific differences um, uh, between the sexes of Lepidoptera. I, I know that's a, a really cool area of research, um, but but yeah, I, I have no idea about the Kino in particular. Um, and and that's a good point because even within a species, we have different re requirements in terms of what uh, what plant resources they're relying on. Um, so maybe maybe if we consider, okay, even though if we look at the kino as a whole species, it has many different plant species. If we just look at that the female sex, it's actually much more vulnerable because it's relying on fewer plant resources. So that that's really interesting. I like to. Uh, potentially incorporate that into the app as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, Arlie Montalvo asks, did you use CCH2, which is the um, Consortium of California Herbaria for plant distributions and other, and other sources? Maybe what are the sources for the plant yeah. distribution? So I did use CCH2. Um, they are undergoing a whole renovation of their system from my understanding. Um, and so I reached out to the Berkeley folk and asked about that, and they sent me what they said is probably the best bet in getting the most up-to-date data, so I did incorporate that. I also used uh, Calscape's data, so, and I believe it, it may come from the same source, um, it may be the exact same source, I'm not entirely sure. 
Um, but I am always looking for new sources of plant and insect location data for this application. So if anyone has uh, recommendations of where to look for that, um, I'd love to hear them. I've used sources like iNaturalist or the research grade iNaturalist observations. I've used Calscape, I've used Bug Guide, um, but I'm always looking for more because really at the end of the day, the more data for plant and insect occurrences across the state, the better tool this will be. Um, one of the main limitations right now is that some remote locations in California just don't have enough data. So you're not gonna get good results out there. Um, around our urban areas, we usually get really good um, results because that's where people are, are doing those observations of plants and insects, but yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, another question from Drew Feldman. If you click on an entry in the network, are the lines highlighted so you can separate them from all the other black lines? Oh, that's, um, if I understand your question correctly, you mean um, like when you click on a species in that list, does it highlight its interactions in the, the actual network figure? Um, if, if that's not what you're asking, let me know, excuse me. But that is actually a great question because it's something I'm trying to, to work on. So as it is now, these network figures are not super informative. I, I basically included them in there because some people are interested in them. Um, you know, seeing like, what does my local pollinator community look like? Um, but they're not super useful because again, like especially when they're very large networks, um, you can't really see what's going on in there because there's so many lines connecting so many interactions. Um, what I'd like to do is exactly what you said is uh, have some sort of interactive component where when you click on a species, you can see where it is in that network. Um, that's kind of a, a coding issue that I've been working on to try to figure out, but hopefully in future updates, that will be one of the features. Um, Arlie Montalvo asks, are planted natives that are not actually native here included? For example, Aeschylus californica is in the UC Botanic Garden, but it's not a native species here. Hmm. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, so I didn't realize that Aeschylus, sorry, I, I need to I, step on my, my I, I think that's an artifact of the of the consortium data. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. So that's that's another huge limitation right now. And like I said, I'm working with Calscape um, to, to fix some of these issues. Um, number one, there's some invasive insect species included in there that I need to get out of the data. Um, so I'm working on that. Number two, yeah, as you just pointed out, and that's really useful because I wasn't aware of that, it's picking up observations from things like botanic gardens, maybe even people's yards that planted something native to California, but not native to this area. Um, so that's a really, really good, um, really good observation that I need to fix as well. So, so yeah, so, like, uh, yeah, go for it. So if you if you go to the Jepson disputed um, uh, disputed uh, taxa are uh, shown in a different color. And um, so there may be a way to work with that so as to not import them. Yeah. And you may want to also talk to the Calflora people who are really good at importing data yeah. and using the same data set. Yeah, that's really good advice. I thought, so when I had used the consortium data, I, I thought I had filtered it for um, wild plants only because I, I thought of that. Like, I don't want I don't want plants showing up in the data set because they're in someone's yard, but it's like a Northern California species that we have in Southern California. Um, so I, I thought that selecting wild plants only would find those ones that are just like in our natural areas, but it's possible that something somehow got included in there. Um, but yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I'll, I'll make a note of that and include that in the next round of edits. Like I said, the app is a continual work in progress. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on it, but. Um, yeah. Great. Um, okay, this next one is also from Arlie Montalvo. 
I noticed Erigeron canadensis, also known as Canisa canadensis, came up. It is common horseweed. This one can take over landscapes and is categorized as a noxious weed. Would it be possible to put in some cautions about some plants? Yeah, that's another great point. So um, along the same lines, uh, basically what needs to be done is, and I unfortunately don't have time for this because of my other dissertation work, so I'm looking for um, potential um, help on this, but I, I essentially need someone to go through that list of native plants. Um, first of all, make sure there's not, no non-natives in there, which there shouldn't be, but also, yeah, like noxious weeds, like even though it's native, some of our native plants can be considered pests, um, you know, plants that we don't necessarily want taking over. Um, so that's a really good point. And some of these plants also just don't do well when we plant them in landscaping contexts. So maybe, um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of our herbivore plants are, are trees, uh, you know, our, our woody plant species, oaks and um, stuff like that. And maybe people aren't necessarily going to plant a big oak tree in a small urban yard or something like that. So maybe giving them options like I want a list of er like uh, herbaceous plants that I can plant in a pollinator garden. Um, so yeah, including some of those tools in there is, is also one of my goals. Um, yeah, and you know, if, if as people, whoever's listening now, as you're using this tool, um, if you find a mistake, if you find something you're like, oh, this plant should not be here, or oh, this is an invasive insect species, please email me and let me know. Um, it's a huge data set. We have uh, something like 14,000 interactions in this data set. So again, like cleaning it is a, a huge task going through every single one of those interactions, every single one of those species to make sure that they are the ones that we want included in there. So any help with that is much appreciated. Good. Okay, um, Tom Vineski has a question. Does CNPS have resources to help evaluate an area scheduled for roadway and development? We have an area of mature native shrubs and oaks in Temescal Valley scheduled for destruction. I'd like to see, oh, I'd like to see, sorry, I'd like to see considered for revegetation. I think probably one of you are better yeah. to answer that. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I think Tom, maybe if you'd like to email um, the chapter email, uh, one of us could respond to that, and Orchids put it in the chat. The chapter email is rsbcnps at gmail.com, and we'll work on getting you some information about resources. Let's see, um, a couple of more comments from Arlie. Maybe some CalFlora data would be helpful using the research grade. Um, there is a way to filter the consortium data. She also mentions a lot of disputed taxa are actually okay. The problem has to do with multiple issues and she's suggesting she could maybe help identifying weeds and non-natives. Yeah, Arlie, that would be, I would love your help on that. I really appreciate that. Um, it sounds like I need to have a, a separate conversation with you later because you're having a lot of good ideas here. Um, and it was a challenge for me compiling this data um, because, you know, the, the consortium resource is great because it's all in the same place. The insect data was a lot harder because it's not all in the same place. And I had to kind of use a, as many different data sets as I could. Um, and there are definitely some issues in those data sets. So, um, so yeah, I really appreciate those thoughts um, and thank you. Chris, if you're willing, there's um, actually some more um, comments or excuse me, questions in the chat. I'm gonna just go through those real quick. Um, yeah. One of those says from Harry Moore, the monarch and milkweed relationship is well known. What is the most popular night moth version of uh, this? Oh, that's a great question. So there is only one. So if we're talking about endangered species here, threatened, endangered, um, in the state of California, there's only a single moth species that's listed as, uh, I, I think it's threatened, not even endangered. Um, so let me find the... I always forget the name of it. It's it's called it's an evening primrose moth. Um, I believe it's called the Kern evening primrose moth. 
and it's only known from a couple washes in a certain part uh, of California. That, that would probably be my best answer. I'm trying to find a link that I can drop for you. Um, let's see. And it's actually a day flying moth. Um, so one thing I, I forgot to mention about this data set is that um, as I kind of went through in the beginning of my presentation, uh, we know a lot less about moth pollination. Um, moths uh, have been understudied, underappreciated in many ways. Butterflies get all of the attention, which doesn't really make sense when you consider the, the difference in diversity. Um, but, but one of the limitations of this data says, and you'll notice that if you, if you say, I want to plant a moth garden and you, and you use the tool to filter for, for moths only, you'll see that there are much less uh, plants that are known to support moth pollinators. And that's not because plants are not supporting moth pollinators. It's because we just don't know about it. Um, and that's kind of part of my other research agenda is to start finding those interactions in California, which moths are pollinating which plants at night. Um, we know a lot about moth herbivory because again, uh, moths are much more diverse and caterpillars can be found any time of day. But when it comes to nocturnal interactions, it's much less studied and much less understood. Um, so yeah, what I just dropped was the, the threatened uh, Kern primrose moth. Um, but in terms uh, of other like charismatic species, like the monarch, I think our hawk moths are very charismatic. We have the, the white line sphinx, with it, which is a, probably the most common moth species in California, um, but a really cool looking moth. Hawk moths are very large and they're also known to be extremely important pollinators. So that would be my second, um, any of the hawk moths. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Harry Moore also asks, asks, can you draw an irregular shaped polygon in the app? No, so you cannot at this point. That's a good um, idea. I would have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> um, like I said, I'm not a web developer, so <laughs> some, some of these great ideas like, um, you know, uh, um, putting in different shaped polygons or whatever it is, would require me to spend hours figuring out how to do that in the code, which eventually I will have time to probably once I ha graduate with my PhD, but for <laughs> it good, may... good plan to get the PhD done first. <laughs> um, so ORCID is just reminding anyone who's welcome to support saving important lands by joining CPS and other organizations at public meetings to forestall inappropriate development. And we do have an active conservation committee if you're interested. Uh, let's see, Tom Vineski also asks about getting an evaluation of a swath of native vegetation and how could we begin? Then Tom, again, I think if you just wanna email the RSV CNPS email address and we'll respond, ORCID or somebody else can respond to you. Um, let's see, there's just a lot of good comments, great presentation. Um, Kate Kramer comments that the butterfly net finder could be used to comment on development projects to specify the native species that should be used in landscaping. Let's see, I'm looking for other questions. Yeah, thank you all for your comments and your questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think Arlie's just mentioning she wants to coordinate with you on the Bonamino Park project. Great presentation. Um, what is the, this is from Tom Vineski, what is the best contact info for the Inland Empire CNPS to seek ideas about proposed roadway vegetation? Um, yeah, I think on that one, Tom, why don't I just ask you if you could email us under, at the email, chapter email, rsbcnps at gmail.com. I think that's all the questions. Let me just check real quick again and see if any new questions have popped up. Yeah, if anybody else has a question, um, Chris has shared his email address and you can reach out. Um, great presentation, really um, wonderful work that you're doing and emphasizing um, the importance of moths, mm -hmm. in addition to, of course, our beautiful butterflies. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again, everyone, um, for tuning in and for all your questions. Really appreciate um, 
all the the good thoughts that you had and um you've given me a lot more to think about here and, and good ideas to improve this app so um yeah thanks again hopefully everyone can uh can go plant some some butterfly and moth gardens out there yeah, um, yeah. and thanks to me and orchid for the invite um, and arlie as well for organizing this i really appreciate it thanks a lot Hi, everybody.